Chapter One of Brood of the Dark Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. Brood of the Dark Moon by Charles Diffin. The Message. In a hospital in Vienna, in a room where sunlight flooded through ultraviolet permeable crystal, the warm rays struck upon smooth walls, the colors of which changed from hot reds to cool yellows or gray, or to soothing green, as the directing surgeon might order. An elusive blending of tones now seemed pulsing with life. Surely, even a flickering flame of vitality would be blown into warm livingness in such a place. Even the chart case in the wall glittered with the same clean, brilliant hues from its glass and metal door. The usual revolving paper discs showed white beyond the glass. They were moving, and the ink lines grew to tell a story of temperature and respiration and of every heartbeat. On the identification plate, a name appeared and a date. Chet Bullard, 23 years, admitted, August 10, 1973. And below that, the ever-changing present ticked into the past in silent minutes. August 15, 1973, World Standard Time, 10.38, 10.39, 10.40. For five days the minutes had trickled into a rivulet of time that flowed past a bandaged figure in the bed below, a silent figure and unmoving, as one for whom time has ceased. But the surgeons of the Allied Hospital at Vienna are clever. 10.41, 10.42 The bandaged figure stirred uneasily on a snow-white bed. A nurse was beside him in an instant. Was her patient about to recover consciousness she examined the bandages that covered a ragged wound in his side, where all seemed satisfactory. To all appearances, the man who had moved was unconscious still. The nurse could not know of the thought impressions, blurred at first, then gradually clearing, that were flashing through his mind. Flashing, yet, to the man who struggled to comprehend them, they passed laggingly in review. One picture followed another with exasperating slowness. Where was he? What had happened? He was hardly conscious of his own identity. There was a ship. He held the controls. They were flying low. One hand reached fumbling beneath the soft coverlet to search for a triple star that should be upon his jacket. A triple star, the insignia of a master pilot of the world. And with the movement there came clearly a realization of himself. Chet Bullard, master pilot. He was Chet Bullard, and a wall of water was sweeping under him from the ocean to wipe out the great Harkness terminal buildings. It was Harkness, Walt Harkness, from whom he had snatched the controls. To fly to the dark moon, of course. What nonsense was that? No, it was true. The dark moon had raised a devil with things on earth. How slowly the thoughts came. Why couldn't he remember? Dark moon? And they were flying through space. They had conquered space. They were landing on the dark moon that was brilliantly alight. Walt Harkness had set the ship down beautifully. Then, crowding upon one another in breathtaking haste, came clear recollection of past adventures. They were upon the dark moon, and there was the girl, Diane. They must save Diane. Harkness had gone for the ship. A savage, half-human shape was raising a hairy arm to drive a spear toward Diane, and he, Chet, was leaping before her. He felt again the lancet pain of that blade. And now he was dying, yes, he remembered it now dying in the night on a great sweeping surface of frozen lava. It was only a moment before that he had opened his eyes to see Harkness' strained face and the agonized look of Diane as the two leaned above him. But now he felt stronger. He must see them again. He opened his eyes for another look at his companions, and, 
Instead of black, star-pricked night on a distant globe, there was dazzling sunlight. No desolate lava flow. This. No thousand fires that flared and smoked from their fumaroles in the dark. And instead of Harkness and the girl, Diane, leaning over him, there was a nurse who laid one cool hand upon his blonde head and who spoke soothingly to him of keeping quiet. He was to take it easy. He would understand later, and everything was all right. And with this assurance, Chet Bullard drifted again into sleep. The blurring memories had lost their distortions a week later, as he sat before a broad window in his room and looked out over the housetops of Vienna. Again he was himself, Chet Bullard, with the master pilot's rating, and he let his eyes follow understandingly. The moving picture of the world outside. It was good to be part of the world whose every movement he understood. Those cylinders with stubby wings that crossed and recrossed the sky, their sterns showed a jet of thin vapor where a continuous explosion of detonite threw them through the air. He knew them all, the pleasure craft, the big red-bellied freighters, the sleek liners, whose multiple helicopters spun dazzlingly above as they sank down through the shaft of pale green light that marked a descending area. That one would be the China Mail. Her upper ports were open before the hold-down clamps had gripped her. The mail would pour out in an avalanche of pouches where smaller mail ships waited to distribute the cargo across the land. And the big fellow taking off, her hull banded with blue, was one of Schwartzmann's liners. He wondered what had become of Schwartzmann, the man who had tried to rob Harkness of his ship, who had brought the patrol ships upon them in an effort to prevent their takeoff on that wild trip. For that matter, what had become of Harkness? Chet Bullard was seriously disturbed at the absence of any word beyond the one message that had been waiting for him when he regained consciousness. He drew that message from a pocket of his dressing gown and read it again. Chet, old fellow, lie low. S has vanished. Means mischief. Think best not to see you or reveal your whereabouts until our position firmly established. Have concealed ship. Remember, S will stop at nothing. Trying to discredit us, but the gas I brought will fix all that. Get yourself well. We are planning to go back, of course. Walt. Chet returned the folded message to his pocket. He arose and walked about the room to test his returning strength. To remain idle was becoming increasingly difficult. He wanted to see Walter Harkness talk with him, plan for their return to the wonder world they had found. Instead, he dropped again into his chair and touched the knob on the newscaster beside him. A voice, hushed to the requirements of these hospital precincts, spoke softly of market quotations in the far corners of the earth. He turned the dial irritably and set it on World News General. The name of Harkness came from the instrument to focus Chet's attention. Harkness makes broad claims, the voice was saying. Vienna physicists ridicule his pretensions. Walter Harkness, formerly of New York, proprietor of Harkness Terminals, whose great buildings near New York were destroyed in the dark moon wave, claimed to have reached and returned from the dark moon. Nearly two months have passed since the new satellite crashed into the gravitational field of Earth, its coming manifested by earth shocks and a great tidal wave. The globe, as we know, was invisible, although still unseen, and only a black circle that blocks out distant stars, it is visible in the telescopes of the astronomers. Its distance and its orbital motion have been determined. And now this New Yorker claims to have penetrated space, to have landed on the dark moon, and to have returned to Earth. Broad claims indeed, especially so in view of the fact that Harkness refuses to submit his ship for examination by the Stratosphere Control Board. He has filed notice of ownership, 
thus introducing some novel legal technicalities. But since space travel is still a dream of the future, there will be none to dispute his claims. Of immediate interest is Harkness's claim to have discovered a gas that is fatal to the serpents of space. The monsters that appeared when the dark moon came and that attacked ships above the repelling area are still there. All flying is confined to the lower levels. Fast world routes are disorganized. Whether or not this gas, of which Harkness has a sample, came from the dark moon or from some laboratory on Earth is of no particular importance. Will it destroy the space serpents? If it does this, our hats are off to Mr. Walter Harkness. Almost will we be inclined to believe the rest of his story or to laugh with him over one of the greatest hoaxes ever attempted. Chet had been too intent upon the newscast to heed an opening door at his back. How about it, Chet? A voice was asking. Would you call it a hoax or the real thing? And a girl's voice chimed in with exclamations of delight at sight of the patient, so evidently recovering. Diane, Chet exulted, and Walt, you old son of a gun, he found himself clinging to a girl's soft hand with one of his, while with the other he reached for that of her companion. But Walter Harkness's arm went about his shoulders instead. I'd like to hammer you plenty, Harkness was saying, and I don't even dare give you a friendly slam on the back. How's the side where they got you with the spear? And how are you? How soon will you be ready to start back? What about? Diane Delacour raised her one free hand to stop the flood of questions. My dear, she protested, give Chet a chance. He must be dying for information. I was dying for another reason the last time I saw you, Chet reminded her, up on the dark moon. But it seems that you got me back here in time for repairs. And now what? His nurse came into the room with extra chairs. Chet waited till she was gone before he repeated, Now what? When do we go back? Harkness did not answer at once. Instead, he crossed to the newscaster in its compact metal case. The voice was still speaking softly. At a touch of a switch, it ceased. And in the silence came the soft rush of sound that meant the tell autotype had taken up its work. Beneath the glass, a paper moved, and words came upon it from a hurricane of type bars underneath. The instrument was printing the news story as rapidly as any voice could speak it. Harkness read the words for an instant, then let the paper pass on to wind itself upon a spool. It had still been telling of the gigantic hoax that this eccentric American had attempted, and Harkness repeated the words. A hoax, he exclaimed, and his eyes for a moment flashed angrily beneath the dark hair that one hand had disarranged. I would like to take that facetious bird out about a thousand miles and let him play around with the serpents we met. But why get excited? This is all Schwartzman's doing. The tentacles of that man's influence reach out like those of an octopus. Chet ranged himself alongside. Tall and slim and blonde, he contrasted strongly with this other man, particularly in his own quiet self-control, as against Harkness's quick, flaring anger. Take it easy, Walt, he advised. We'll show them. But I judge that you have been razzed a bit. It's a pretty big story for them to swallow without proof. Why didn't you show them the ship? Or why didn't you let Diane and me back up your yarn? And you haven't answered my other questions. When do we go back? Harkness took the queries in turn. I didn't show the old boat, he explained, because I'm not ready for that yet. I want to keep it dark, dark as the dark moon. I want to do my preliminary work there before Schwartzman and his experts see our ship. He would duplicate it in a hurry and be on our trail. And now for our plans. Well, out there in space, the dark moon is waiting. Have you realized, Chet, that we own that world? You and Diane and I. 
Small, only half the size of our old moon, but what a place. And it's ours. Back in history, you remember, an ambitious lad named Alexander sighed for more worlds to conquer. Well, we're going Alexander one better. We found the world. We're the first ever to go out into space and return again. We'll go back there, the three of us. We will take no others along, not yet. We will explore and make our plans for development, and we will keep it to ourselves until we are ready to hold it against any opposition. And now, how soon can you go? Your injury, how soon will you be well enough? Right now, Chet told him laconically. Today, if you say the word. They've got me welded together, so I'll hold, I reckon. But where's the ship? What have you done? He broke off abruptly to listen. To all three came a muffled, booming roar. The windows beside them shivered with the thud of the distant explosion. They had not ceased their trembling before Harkness had switched on the news broadcast. And it was a minute only until the news-gathering system was on the air. Explosion at the Institute of Physical Science, it stated. This is Vienna broadcasting. An explosion has just occurred. We are given a preliminary announcement only. The laboratories of the scientific institute of this city are destroyed. A number of lives have been lost. The cause has not been determined. It is reported that the laboratories were beginning analytical work on the so-called Harkness Dark Moon gas. Confirmation has just been radioed to this station. Dark moon gas exploded on contact with air. The American Harkness is either a criminal or a madman. He will be apprehended at once. This confirmation comes from Herr Schwartzmann of Vienna, who left the Institute only a few minutes before the explosion occurred. And in the quiet of a hospital room, Walter Harkness drew a long breath and whispered, Schwartzmann, his hand is everywhere and that sample was all I had. I must leave at once, go back to America. He was halfway to the door. He was almost carrying Diane Delacour with him, when Chet's quiet tones brought him up short. I've never seen you afraid, said Chet, and his eyes were regarding the other man curiously. But you seem to have the wind up, as the old fires used to say, when it comes to Schwartzmann. Harkness looked at the girl he held so tightly, then grinned boyishly at Chet. I've someone else to be afraid for now, he said. His smile faded and was replaced by a look of deep concern. I haven't told you about Schwartzman, he said. Haven't had time. But he's poisoned, Chet, and he's after our ship. Where is the ship? Where have you hidden it? Tell me where. Harkness looked about him before he whispered sharply, Our old shop up north. He seemed to feel that some explanation was due Chet. In this day it seemed absurd to say such things, he added. But this Schwartzman is a throwback, a conscienceless scoundrel. He would put all three of us out of the way in a minute if he could get the ship. He knows we have been to the Dark Moon, no question about that. He wants the wealth he can imagine is there. We'll all plan to leave. I'll radio you later. We'll go back to the dark moon. He broke off abruptly as the door opened to admit the nurse. You'll hear from me later, he repeated, and hurried Diane Delacour from the room. But he returned in a moment to stand again at the door. The nurse was still in the room. In case you feel like going for a hop, he told Chet casually, Diane's leaving her ship here for you. You'll find it up above, private landing stage on the roof. Chet answered promptly, Fine, that will go good one of these days. All this for the benefit of listening ears. Yet even Chet would have been astonished to know that he would be using that ship within an hour. He was standing at the window, and his mind was filled, not with thoughts of any complications that had developed for his friend Harkness, but only of the adventures that lay ahead of them both, the dark moon. They had reached it, indeed, but they had barely scratched the surface of that world of mystery and adventure. 
He was wild with eagerness to return, to see again that new world, blazing brightly beneath the sun, to see the valley of fires, and he had the score to settle with the tribe of ape-men, unless Harkness had finished them off while he himself lay unconscious. Yet there seemed little doubt of that. Walt would have paid the score for all of them. He seemed actually back in that world to which his thoughts went winging across the depths of space. The buzz of a telephone recalled him. It was the hospital office, he found, when he answered. There was a message. Would Mr. Bullard kindly receive it on the teleautotype, lever number four, and dial 15.2. Thanks. And Chet depressed a key and adjusted the instrument that had been printing the newscast. The paper moved on beneath the glass, and the type bars clicked more slowly now. From some distant station that might be anywhere on or above the earth, there was coming a message. The frequency of that sending current was changed at some central office. It was stepped down to suit the instrument beside him, and the type was spelling out words that made the watching man breathless and intent until he tore off the paper and leaped for the call signal that would summon the nurse. Through her he would get his own clothes, his uniform, the triple star that showed his rating, and his authority in every air level of the world. That badge would have got him immediate attention on any landing field. Now on the flat roof, with steady gray eyes and a voice whose very quietness accentuated its imperative commands, Chet had the staff of the hospital hangars as alert as if their alarm had sounded a general ambulance call. Straight into the sky a red beacon made a rigid column of light. A radio sender was crackling a warning and a demand for clear air. From the forty level a patrol ship that had caught the signal came corkscrewing down the red shaft to stand by for emergency work. Chet called her commander from the cabin of Diane's ship. A word of thanks, Chet's number, and a dismissal of the craft. Then the white light signaled all clear, and the hold-down levers let go with a soft hiss. The feel of the controls was good to his hands. The ship roared into life. A beautiful little cruiser, the ship of Diane's, her twin helicopters lifted her gracefully into the air. The column of red light had changed to blue, the mark of an ascending area. Chet touched a switch. A muffled roar came from the stern, and the blast drove him straight out for a mile. Then he swung and returned. He was nosing up as he touched the blue, straight up. And he held the vertical climb until the altimeter before him registered 60,000. Traffic is northbound only, on the sixty level, and Chet set his ship on a course for the frozen wastes of the Arctic. He gave her the gun and nodded in tight-lipped satisfaction at the mounting thunder that answered from the stern. Only then did he read again the message on a torn fragment of teleautotype paper. Harkness was the signature, and above, a brief warning and a call. Danger must leave at once. You get ship and stand by. I will meet you there. And, for the first time, Chet found time to wonder at this danger that had set the hard-headed, hard-hitting Walt Harkness into a flutter of nerves. What danger could there be in this well-guarded world? A patrol ship passed below him as he asked himself the question. It was symbolic of a world at peace, a world too busy with its own tremendous development to find time for wars or makers of war. What trouble could this man Schwartzman threaten that a word to the Peace Enforcement Commission would not quell? Where could he go to elude the inescapable patrols? And suddenly Chet saw the answer to that question, saw plainly where Schwartzman could go, those vast reaches of black space. If Schwartzman had their ship, he could go where they had gone go out to the dark moon, and Harkness had warned Chet to get their ship and stand by. 
Had Walt learned of some plan of Schwartzmann's? Chet could not answer the question, but he moved the control rheostat over to the last notch. From the body of the craft came an unending roar of a generator where nothing moved, where only the terrific, explosive impact of bursting detonite drove out from the stern to throw them forward. A good little ship, Chet had said of this cruisers of Diane's, and he nodded approval now of a ground speed detector whose quivering needle had left the 500 mark. It touched 600, crept on, and trembled at 700 miles an hour with the top speed of the ship. There was a position finder in the little control room, and Chet's gaze returned to it often to see the pinpoint of light that crept slowly across the surface of the globe. It marked their ever-changing location, and it moved unerringly toward a predetermined goal. It was a place of ice and snow and bleak outcroppings of half-covered rocks where he descended, lost from the world, a place where even high levels seldom echoed to the roar of passing ships. It had been a perfect location for their shop. Here he and Walt had assembled their mystery ship. He had to search intently over the icy waste to find the exact location. A dim red glow from a hidden sun shone like pale fire across the distant black hills. But the hills gave him a bearing, and he landed at last beside a vaguely outlined structure, half hidden in drifting snow. The dual fans dropped him softly upon the snow ground, and Chet, as he walked toward the great locked doors, was trembling from other causes than the cold. Would the ship be there? He was suddenly aquiver with excitement at the thought of what this ship meant, the adventure, the exploration that lay ahead. The door swung back. In the warm and lighted room was a cylinder of silvery white. Its bow ended in a gapping port, where a mighty exhaust could roar forth to check the ship's forward speed. There were other ports ranged about the gleaming body. Above the hull, a control room projected flatly. Its lookout shone in the brilliance of the nitron illuminator that flooded the room with light. Chet Bullard was breathless as he moved on into the room. His wild experiences that had seemed but a weird dream were real again. The dark moon was real, and they would be going back to it. The muffled beating of great helicopters was sounding in his ears. Outside, a ship was landing. This would be Harkness coming to join him, yet, even as the thought flashed through his mind, it was countered by a quick denial. To the experienced hearing of the master pilot, this sound of many fans meant no little craft. It was a big ship that was landing, and it was coming down fast. The blue-striped monster looming large in the glow of the midnight sun was not entirely a surprise to Chet's staring eyes. But, blue-striped, the markings of the Schwartzmann line. He had hardly sensed the danger when it was upon him. A man, heavy and broad of frame, was giving orders. Only once had Chet seen this Herr Schwartzmann, but there was no mistaking him now, and he was sending a squad of rushing figures toward the man who struggled to close a great door. Chet crouched to meet the attack. He was outnumbered. He could never win out, but the knowledge of his own helplessness was nothing beside that other conviction that flooded him with sickening certainty. A hoax. That's what they had called Walt's story. Schwartzmann had so named it, and now Schwartzmann had been the one to fool them. The message was a fake, a bait to draw him out, and he, Chet, had taken the bait. He had led Schwartzmann here, had delivered their ship into his hands. He landed one blow on the nearest face. He had one glimpse of a clubbed weapon swinging above him, and the world went dark. End of chapter 1《of the Dark Moon》by Charles Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
into space. A pulsing pain that stabbed through his head was Chet's first conscious impression. Then, as objects came slowly into focus before his eyes, he knew that above him a ray of light was striking slantingly through the thick glass of a control room lookout. Other lookouts were black, the dead black of empty space. Through them, sparkling points of fire showed here and there, suns, sending their light across millions of years to strike at last on a speeding ship. But from that one port that caught the brighter light came the straight ray to illumine the room. Space, thought Chek vaguely. That is the sunlight of space. He was trying to arrange his thoughts in some sensible sequence. His head. What had happened to his head? And then he remembered. Again he saw a clubbed weapon descending, while the face of Schwartzmann stared at him through bulbous eyes. In this control room where he lay, he knew in an instant where he was. It was his own ship that was roaring and trembling beneath him, his and Walt Harkness's, and it was flying through space. And with the sudden realization of what this meant, he struggled to arise. Only then did he see the figure at the controls. The man was leaning above an instrument board. He straightened to stare from a rear port while he spoke to someone Chet could not see. "'There's more of them coming,' he said in a choked voice. "'Mine got. Never can we get away.' He fumbled with shaking hands at instruments and controls. And now Chet saw his chalk-white face and read plainly the terror that was written there. But the cords that cut into his own wrists and ankles reminded him that he was bound. He settled back upon the floor. Why struggle? If this other pilot was having trouble, let him get out of it by himself. Let him kill his own snakes. That the man was having trouble, there was no doubt. He looked once more behind him, as if at something that pursued, then swung the ball control to throw the ship off her course. The craft answered sluggishly, and Chet Bullard grinned where he lay, helpless upon the floor, for he knew that his ship should have been thrown crashingly aside with such a motion as that. The answer was plain. The flask of super detonite was exhausted, and here was the last feeble explosion of the final atoms of that terrible explosive that was being admitted to the generator. And to cut in another flask meant the opening of a hidden valve. Chet forgot the pain of his swelling hands to shake with suppressed mirth. This was going to be good. He forgot it until, through a lookout, he saw a writhing, circling fire that wrapped itself about the ship and jarred them to a halt. The serpents, those horrors from space that had come with the coming of the dark moon. They had disrupted the high-level traffic of the world, had seized great liners, torn their way in, stripped them of every living thing, and let the empty shells crash back to Earth. Chet had forgotten, or he had failed to realize, the height at which this new pilot was flying. Only speed could save them, the monsters, with their snouts that were great suction cups, could wrench off a metal door, tear out the glass from a port. He saw the luminous mass crush itself against the forward lookout and felt the jar of its body against their ship. Soft and vaporous, these cloud-like serpents seemed as they drifted through space, yet the impact when they struck proved that this new matter had mass. Chet saw the figure at the control stagger back and cower in fear. The man's bullet-shaped head was covered by his upraised arms. There was some horror outside those windows that his eyes had no wish to see. Beside him the towering figure of Schwartzmann appeared. He had sprung into Chet's view, and he screamed orders at the fear-stricken pilot. "'Fool! Swine!' Schwartzmann was shouting. "'Do something! You said you could fly this ship. In desperation he leaped forward and reached for the controls himself. 
Chet's blurred faculties snapped sharply to attention. That yellow glow against the port, the jarring of their ship, it meant instant destruction once that searching snout found some place where it could secure a hold. If the air pressure within the ship was released, if even a crack were opened... Here you, he shouted to the frantic Schwartzman, who was jerking frenziedly at the controls that no longer gave response. Cut these ropes. Leave those instruments alone, you fool. He was suddenly vibrant with hate as he realized what this man had done. He had struck him, Chet, down as he would have felled an animal for butchery. He had stolen their ship, and now he was losing it. Chet hardly thought of his own desperate plight in his rage at this threat to their ship and at Schwartzman's inability to help himself. Cut these ropes, he repeated. Damn it all. Turn me loose. I can fly us out. He added his frank opinion of Schwartzman and all his men. And Schwartzman, though his dark face flushed angrily red for one instant, leaped to Chet's side and slashed at the cords with a knife. The room swam before Chet's dizzy eyes as he came to his feet. He half fell, half drew himself full length toward the valve that he alone knew. Then again he was on his feet, and he gripped at the ball control with one hand, while he opened a master throttle that cut in this new supply of explosive. The room had been silent with the silence of empty space, save only for the scraping of a horrid body across the ship's outer shell. The silence was shattered now, as if by the thunder of many guns. There was no time for easing themselves into gradual flight. Chet thrust forward on the ball control, and the blast from their stern threw the ship as if it had been fired from a gigantic cannon. The self-compensating floor swung back and up. Chet's weight was almost unbearable, as the ship beneath him leaped out and on and the terrific blast that screamed and thundered urged their speeding shell to greater and still greater speed. And then, with the facility that speed gave, Chet's careful hands moved a tiny metal ball within its magnetic cage, and the great ship bellowed from many ports as it followed the motion of that ball. Could an eye have seen the wild, twisting flight? It must have seen as if the pilot and the ship had gone suddenly mad. The craft corkscrewed and whirled. It leaped upward and aside. And as the glowing mass was thrown clear of the lookout, Chet's hand moved again to that maximum forward position. And again the titanic blast from the stern drove them on and out. There were other shapes ahead, glowing lines of fire, luminous masses like streamers of clouds, that looped themselves into contorted forms and writhed vividly until they straightened out in the sharp lines of speed that bore down upon the fleeing craft and the human food that was escaping these hungry snouts. Chet saw them dead ahead. He saw the outthrust heads, each ending in a great suction cup, the row of discs that were eyes blazing above and the gapping maw below. He altered their course not a hair's breadth as he bore down upon them while the monster swelled prodigiously before his eyes, and the thunderous roar from astern came with never a break, while the ship itself ceased its trembling protest against the sudden blast and drove smoothly on and into the waiting beasts. There was a hardly perceptible thudding jar. They were free and the forward lookout showed only the brilliant fires of distant suns, and one more glorious than the rest that meant a planet. Chet turned at last to face Schwartzman and his pilot, where they had clung helplessly to a metal stanchion. Four or five others crept in from the cabin aft. Their blanched faces told of the fear that had gripped them, fear of the serpents, fear too, of the terrific plunges into which the ship had been thrown. Chet Bullard threw the metal control ball back into neutral, 
and permitted himself the luxury of a laugh. "'You're a fine bunch of highwaymen,' he told Schwartzman. "'You'll steal a ship you can't fly. Then come up here above the R.A. level and get mixed up with those brutes. What's the idea? Did you think you would just hop over to the Dark Moon? Some little plan like that in your mind?' Again the dark, heavy face of Schwartzman flushed deeply, but it was his own men upon whom he turned. You, he told the pilot, you were so clever. You would knock this man senseless. You would insist that you could fly the ship. The pilot's eyes still bulged with the fear he had just experienced. But, Herr Schwartzman, it was you who told me. A barrage of unintelligible words cut his protest short. Schwartzman poured forth imprecations in an unknown tongue, then turned to the others. Back, he ordered. Bah, such men. The danger, it is over, yes. This pilot will take us back safely. He turned his attention now to the waiting Chet. Herr Bullard, is it not? Yes. He launched into extended apologies. He had wanted a look at this so marvelous ship. He had spied upon it, he admitted it, but this murderous attack was none of his doings. His men had got out of hand, and then he had thought it best to take Chet, unconscious as he was, and return with him where he could have care. And Chet Bullard kept his eyes steadily upon the protesting man and said nothing. But he was thinking of a number of things. There was Walt's warning. This Schwartzman means mischief and the fake message that had brought him from the hospital to get the ship from its hiding place. No, it was too much to believe. But Chet's eyes were unchanging, and he nodded shortly in agreement, as the other concluded. "'You will take us back?' Schwartzman was asking. "'I will repay you well for what inconvenience we have caused. This ship. You will return it safely to the place where it was. And Chet, after making and discarding a score of plans, knew there was nothing else he could do. He swung the little metal ball into a sharply banked turn. The straight ray of light from an impossibly brilliant sun struck now on the forward lookout. It shone across the shoulder of a great globe to make a white, shining crescent as of a giant moon. It was Earth and Chet brought the bow sights to bear on that far-off target, while again the thunderous blast was built up to drive them back along the trackless path on which they had come. But he wondered, as he pressed forward on the control, what the real plan of this man, Schwartzman, might be. Less than half an hour brought them to the repelling area, and Chet felt the upward surge as he approached it. Here, above this magnetic field, where gravitation's pull was nullified, had been the air lanes for fast liners, empty lanes they were now, for the R.A., as the flying fraternity knew it, the heaviside layer of an earlier day, marked the danger line above which the mysterious serpents lay in wait. Only the speed of Chet's ship saved them. More than one of the luminous monsters was in sight as he plunged through the invisible R.A., and threw on their bow blast strongly to check their fall. Then, as he set a course that would take them to that section of the Arctic waste where the ship had been, he pondered once more upon the subject of his Schwartzman, of the shifty eyes and the glib tongue, and of his men who had got out of hand and had captured this ship. Why in thunder are we back here? Chet asked himself in perplexity. This big boy means to keep the ship, and whatever his plans may have been before, he will never stop short of the dark moon now that he has seen the old boat perform. Then why didn't he keep on when he was started? Had the serpents frightened him back? He was still mentally proposing questions to which there seemed no answer, when he felt the pressure of a metal tube against his back. The voice of Schwartzman was in his ears. This is a detonite pistol. The voice was no longer unctuous and self-deprecating. One move, 
and I'll plant a charge inside you that will smash you to a jelly. There were hands that gripped Chet before he could turn. His arms were wrenched backward, and he was helpless in the grip of Schwartzmann's men. The former pilot sprang forward. Take control, Max, Schwartzmann snapped, but he followed it with a question while the pilot was reaching for the ball. You can fly it for sure, Max? The man called Max answered confidently. Yavol, he said, with eager assurance. Up top there would have been no trouble, yet for what? Verdampt verloren, valve. That one experimental trip is enough. I fly it. Those who held Chet were binding his wrists. He was thrown to the floor while his feet were tied, and, as a last precaution, a gag was forced into his mouth. Schwartzmann left this work to his men. He paid no attention to Chet. He was busy at the radio. He placed the sending levers in strange positions that would affect a blending of wavelengths which only one receiving instrument could pick up. He spoke cryptic words into the microphone, then dropped into a language that was unfamiliar to Chet. Yet even then it was plain that he was giving instructions. He repeated familiar words. Harkness, Chet heard him say, and Delacour, ya, ja, Mademoiselle Delacour. Then leaving the radio, he said, put my ship inside the hangar, and the pilot, Max, grounded their own ship to allow the men to leap out and float into the big building, the big aircraft, in which Schwartzmann had come. Now close the door, their leader ordered. Leave everything as it was. And to the pilot he gave added instruction. There is no air traffic here. You will to forty thousand ascend, and you will wait over this spot. Contemptuously, he kicked aside the legs of the bound man, that he might walk back into the cabin. The takeoff was not as smooth as it would have been had Chet's slim hands been on the controls. This burly one who handled them now was not accustomed to such sensitivity. But Chet felt the ship lift and lurch, then settle down to a swift spiraling ascent. Now he lay still as he tried to ponder the situation. Now what dirty work are they up to? he asked himself. He had seen a sullen fury on the dark face of Herr Schwartzmann as he spoke the names of Walt and Diane into the radio. Chet remembered the look now, and he struggled vainly with the cords about his wrists. Even a detonite pistol, with its tiny grain of explosive in the end of each bullet, would not check him, not when Walt and Diane were endangered and the expression on that heavy, scowling face had told him all too clearly that some real danger threatened. But the cords held fast on his swollen wrists. His head was still throbbing, and even his side, not entirely healed, was adding to the torment that beat upon him, beat and beat with his pulsing blood, until the beating faded out into unconsciousness. Dimly he knew they were soaring still higher, as their radio picked up the warning of an approaching patrol ship. Vaguely, he realized that they had descended again to a level of observation. Chet knew in some corner of his brain that Schwartzmann was watching from an under lookout with a powerful glass, and he heard his excited command. Down, go slowly down. They are landing. They have entered the hangar. Now down with it, Max. Down, down. Plunging fall of the ship roused Chet from his stupor. He felt the jolt of the clumsy landing, despite the snow-cushioned ground. He heard plainly the exclamations from beyond an open port, the startled oath in Walter Harkness's voice, and the stinging scorn in the words of Diane Delacour. Herr Schwartzmann had been in the employ of Mademoiselle Delacour, but he was taking orders no longer. There was a sound of scuffling feet, and once the thud of a blow. Then Chet watched with heavy, hopeless eyes as the familiar faces of Diane and Walt appeared in the doorway. Their hands were bound. They, too, were threatened with a slim-barreled pistol in the hands 
of the smirking, exultant Schwartzmann. A tall, thin-faced man who Chet had not seen before followed them into the room. The newcomer was motioned forward now as Schwartzmann called an order to the pilot. All right, now we go. Max, Herr Dr. Kreiss will give you the bearings. He knows his way among the stars. Herr Schwartzmann doubled over in laughing appreciation of his own success before he straightened up and regarded his captives with cold eyes. Such a pleasure, he mocked. Such charming passengers to take with me on my first trip into space. This ship, it is not so good. I will build better ships later on. I will let you see them when I shall come to visit you. He laughed again at sight of the wandering looks in the eyes of the three. Stooping, he jerked the gag from Chet's mouth. You do not understand, he exclaimed. I should have explained. You see, mein guten Freund, we go, Ach, you have guessed it already. We go to the dark moon. I am pleased to take you with me on the trip out. But coming back, I will have so much to bring. There will be no room for passengers. I could have killed you here, he said, and his mockery gave place for a moment to a savage tone. But the patrol ships, they are everywhere. But I have influence here and there. I arranged that your flask of gas should be charged with explosive. I discredited you, and yet, I could not so great a risk take as to kill you all. So came inspiration. I called your foolish young friend here from the hospital. I ordered him to go at once to the ship hidden where I could not find, and I signed the name of Herr Harkness. Chet caught the silent glances of his friends, who could yet smile hopefully through the other emotions that possessed them. He ground his teeth, as the smooth voice of Herr Schwartzmann went on. He led me here, the young fool, then I sent for you, and this time I signed his name, and you came. So simple. And now we go in my ship to my new world, and, he added savagely, if one of you makes the least trouble, he will land on the dark moon, yes, but he will land hard, from ten thousand feet up. The great generator was roaring. To Chet came the familiar lift of the R.A. effect. They were beyond the R.A. They were heading out and away from Earth, and his friends were captives through his own unconscious treachery, carried out into space in their own ship, with the hands of an enemy gripping the controls. Chet's groan as he turned his face away from the others, who had tried to smile cheerfully, had nothing to do with the pain of his body. It was his mind that was torturing him. He muttered broken words as he lay there, words that had reference to one Schwartzman. I'll get him, damn him, I'll get him. He was promising himself. Herr Schwartzman, who was clever, would have proved his cleverness still more by listening. For a master pilot of the world does not get his rating on vain boasts. He must know first his flying, his ships, and his air. But he is apt to make good in other ways as well. End of chapter 2《Of Brood of the Dark Moon》by Charles Diffin This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Out of Control Walter Harkness had built this ship with Chet's help. They had designed it for space travel. It was the first ship to leave the Earth under its own power, reach another heavenly body, and come back for a safe landing. But they had not installed any luxuries for the passengers. In the room where they were confined, there were no self-compensating chairs such as the Highliners used, but the acceleration of the speeding ship was constant and the rear wall became their floor when they sat or paced back and forth. Their bonds had been removed, and one of Harkness's hands was gripping Diane's where they sat side by side. Chet was briskly limbering his cramped muscles. He glanced at the two who sat silent nearby. 
and he knew what was in their minds, knew that each was thinking of the other, forgetting their own danger, and it was these two who had saved his life on their first adventure out in space. Walt, one man who was never spoiled by his millions, and Diane, straight and true as they make them. Some way, somehow, they must be saved. Thus ran his thoughts, but it looked bad for them all. Schwartzmann, no use kidding themselves about that lad. He was one bad hombre. The best they could hope for was to be marooned on the dark moon, left there to live or die amid those savage surroundings, and the worst that might happen. But Chet refused to think of what alternatives might occur to the ugly, distorted mind of the man who had them at his mercy. There was no echo of these thoughts when he spoke. The smile that flashed across his lean face brought a brief response from the despondent countenances of his companions. Well, Chet observed, and ran his hands through a tangle of blonde hair. I've heard that Schwartzmann's lines give service, and I reckon I heard right. Here we are wanting to go back to the dark moon, and... He paused to point toward a black port light where occasional lights flashed past. I'll say we're going, going somewhere at least. All I hope is that that Maxie boy doesn't find the dark moon at about ten thousand per. He may be a great little skipper on a nice slow, five hundred maximum freighter, but not on this boat. I don't like his landings. Diane Delacour raised her eyes to smile approvingly upon him. You're good, Chet, she said. You are a darn good sport. They knock you down out of control, and you nose right back up for a forty-thousand-foot zoom. And you try to carry us with you. Well, I guess it's time we got over our gloom. Now, what is going to happen? I'll tell you, said Walter Harkness, looking at his watch. If that fool pilot of Schwartzmann's doesn't cut his stern thrust and build up a bow resistance, we'll overshoot our mark and go tearing on a few hundred thousand miles in space. Diane was playing up to Chet's lead. Bien, she exclaimed. A few million, perhaps. Then we may see some of those Martians we've been speculating about. I hear they're handsome. My Walter, much better looking than you. Maybe this is all for the best after all. Say, Harkness protested, if you two idiots don't know enough to worry as you ought, I don't see any reason why I should do all the heavy worrying for the whole crowd. I guess you've got the right idea at that. Take what comes, when it gets here, or when we get there. Small wonder, thought Chet, that Herr Schwartzmann stared at them in puzzled bewilderment when he flung open the door and took one long stride into the room. Stocky, heavy-muscled, he stood regarding them, a frown of suspicion drawing his face into ugly lines. Plainly, he was disturbed by this laughing good humor, where he had expected misery and hopelessness and tears. He moved the muzzle of a detonite pistol back and forth. "'You have been drinking,' he stated at last. "'You were intoxicated, all of you.' His eyes darted searching glances about the little room that was too bare to hide any cause for inebriation. It was Mademoiselle Diane who answered him with an emphatic shake of her dark head. An engaging smile tugged at the corners of her lips. Moi? Non, my dear Herr Schwartzmann, she assured him. It is joy, just happiness, at again approaching our moon, and in such good company, too. Fortunes of war, Schwartzmann declared Harkness. We know how to accept them, and we don't hold it against you. We are down now, but your turn will come. The man's reply was a sputtering of rage in words that neither Chet nor Harkness could understand. The latter turned to the girl with a question. Did you get it, Diane? What did he say? I think I would not care to translate it literally, said Diane Delacour, twisting her soft mouth into an expression of distaste. But speaking generally, he disagrees with you. 
Herr Schwartzmann was facing Harkness belligerently. You think you know something. What is it? he demanded. You are under my feet. I kick you, as I would meinen Hund, and you can do nothing. He aimed a savage kick into the air to illustrate his meaning, and Harkness's face flushed suddenly scarlet. Whatever retort was on Harkness's tongue was left unspoken. A sharp look from Chet, who brought his fingers swiftly to his lips in a gesture of silence, checked the reply. The action was almost unconscious on Chet's part. It was as unpremeditated as the sudden thought that flashed abruptly into his mind. They were helpless. They were in this brute's power, beyond the slightest doubt. Schwartzmann's words, you know something, what is it, had fired a swift train of thought. The idea was nebulous as yet, but if they could throw a scare into this man, make him think there was danger ahead, yes, that was it. Make Schwartzmann think they knew of dangers that he could not avoid. They had been there before. Make this man afraid to kill them. The dreadful alternative that Chet had feared to think of might be averted. All this came in an instantaneous, flashing correlation of his conscious thoughts. I'll tell you what we mean, he told Schwartzmann. He even leaned forward to shake an impressive finger before the other's startled face. I'll tell you first of all that it doesn't make a damn bit of difference who is on top, or it won't in a few hours more. We'll all be washed out together. I've landed once on the dark moon. I know what will happen. And do you know how fast we are going? Do you know the moon's speed as it approaches? Have you thought what you will look like when that fool pilot rams into it head on? And that isn't all. He grinned derisively in the Schwartzman's flushed face, disregarding the half-raised pistol. It was as if some secret thought had filled him with overpowering amusement. His broad grin grew into a laugh. That isn't all, big boy. What will you do if you do land? What will you do when you open the ports and the... He cut his words short, and the smile, with all other expression, was carefully erased from his young face. No, I reckon I won't spoil the surprise. We got through it all right. Maybe you will, too. Maybe. And again it was Diane who played up the Chet's lead without a moment's hesitation. Chet, she demanded, aren't you going to warn him? You would not allow him and his men to be. She stopped in apparent horror of the unsaid words. Chet gave her an approving glance. We'll see about that when we get there, Diane. He turned abruptly back to Schwartzman. I'll forget what a rotten winner you have been. I'll help you out. I'll take the controls if you like. Of course your man Max may set us down without damage, then again. Take them. Schwartzman ungraciously made an order of his acceptance. Take the controls, Herr Bullard. But if you make a single false move, the menacing pistol completed the threat. But Herr Bullard merely turned to his companion with a level, understanding look. Come on, he said. You can both help in working out our location. He stepped before the burly man that Diane might precede them through the door, and he felt the hand of Walt Harkness on his arm in a pressure that told what could not be said aloud. There were pallid-faced men in the cabin through which they passed, men who stared and stared from the window ports into the black immensity of space. Chet, too, stopped to look. They had been no portholes in that inner room where they had been confined. He knew what to expect. He knew how awe-inspiring would be the sight of strange, luminous bodies, great islands of light, masses of animalculae that glowed suddenly, then melted again into black velvet. A whirl of violet grew almost golden in sudden motion. Chet knew it for an invisible monster of space, glowing luminous as it threw itself upon a subtle mass of shimmering light. It faded like a flickering flame and went dark 
as its motion ceased. Life, life, everywhere in this ocean of space, and on every hand was death. Not surprising, Chet realized, that these other earthmen are awed and trembling. The sun was above them. Its light struck squarely down through the upper ports. This was polarized light. There was nothing outside to reflect or refract it, and coming as a straight beam from above, it made a brilliant circle upon the floor from which it was diffused throughout the room. It was as if the floor itself was the illuminating agent. No eye could bear to look into the glare from above, nor was there need, for the other ports drew the eyes with their black depths of unplumbed space. Black, so velvet as to seem almost tangible. Could one have reached out a hand, that blackness, it seemed, must be a curtain that the hand could draw aside. Were unflickering points of light pricked through the dark to give promise of some radiant glory beyond. They had seen it before, these three, yet Chet caught the eyes of Harkness and Diane, and knew that his own eyes must share something of the look he saw in theirs, something of reverent wonder and a strange humility before this evidence of transcendent greatness. Their own immediate problem seemed gone. The tyranny of this glowering human and his men, the effort of the whole world and its struggling millions, how absurdly unimportant it all was, how it faded to insignificance, and yet... Chet came from the reverie that held him. There was one man by whom this beauty was unseen. Herr Schwartzmann was angrily ordering them on, and surprisingly Chet laughed aloud. This problem, he realized, was his problem, his to solve with the help of the other two. And it was not insignificant. He knew, with some sudden wordless knowledge, that there was nothing in all the great scheme but that it had its importance. This vastness that was beyond the power of human mind to grasp ceased to be formidable. He was part of it. He felt buoyed up and he led the way confidently toward the control room door where Schwartzmann stood. The scientist, who Schwartzmann had called Herr Dr. Kreiss, was beside the pilot. He was leaning forward to search the stars in the blackness ahead, but the pilot turned often to stare through the rear lookouts, as if drawn in fearful fascination by what was there. Chet took the controls at Schwartzmann's orders, the pilot saluted with a trembling hand and vanished into the cabin at the rear. Ready for flying orders, doctor, the new pilot told Herr Kreiss. I'll put her where you say, within reason. Behind him he heard the choked voice of Mademoiselle Diane. Regarde, a mon Dieu, the beauty of it, this loveliness, it hurts. One hand was pressed to her throat. Her face was turned as the pilot's had been, that she might stare and stare at the quite impossible moon, a great half-disk of light in the velvet dark. This loveliness, it hurts. Chet looked, too, and knew what Diane was feeling. There was a catch of emotion in his own throat, a feeling that was almost fear. A giant half-moon, and he knew it was the earth, Golden earth light came to them in a flooding glory. The blazing sun struck on it from above to bring out half the globe in brilliant gold that melted to softest, iridescent rainbow tints about its edge. Below, hung motionless in the night, was another sphere, like a reflection of earth in the depths of some Stygian lake. The old moon shone, too, in a half-circle of light. Small wonder that these celestial glories brought a gasp of delight from Diane, or drew into lines of fear the face of that other pilot, who saw only his own world slipping away. But Chet Bullard, master pilot of the world, swung back to scan a star chart that the scientist was holding, then to search out a similar grouping in the black depths 
into which they were plunging, and to bring the crosshairs of a rigidly mounted telescope upon that distant target. How far, he asked himself, in a half-spoken thought, how far have we come? There was an instrument that ticked off the seconds in this seemingly timeless void. He pressed a small lever beside it, and beneath the glass that magnified the readings, there passed the time tape. Each hour and minute was there, each movement of the controls was indicated, each trifling variation in the power of the generator's blast. Chet made some careful computations and passed the paper to Harkness, who tilted the time tape recorder that he might see the record. Check this, will you, Walt? Chet was asking. It is based on the time of our other trip. Acceleration assumed as 1,000 miles per hour out of air. The scientist interrupted. He spoke in English that was carefully precise. It should lie directly ahead, the dark moon. I have calculated with exactness. Walter Harkness snatched up a pair of binoculars. He swung sharply from lookout to lookout while he searched the heavens. It's damn lucky for us that you made a slight error, Chet was telling the other. Error? Christ challenged. Impossible. Then you and I are dead right this minute, Chet told him. We are crossing the orbit of the dark moon, crossing at 20,000 miles per hour relative to Earth, slightly in excess of that figure relative to the dark moon. If it had been here... He had been watching Harkness anxiously and bit off his words as the binoculars were thrust into his hand. There she comes, Harkness told him quietly. It's up to you. But Chet did not need the glasses. With his unaided eyes he could see a faint circle of violet light. It lay ahead and slightly above, and it grew visibly larger as he watched. A ring of nothingness, whose outline was the faintest shimmering halo. More of the distant stars winked out swiftly behind that ghostly circle. It was a dark moon, and it was rushing upon them. Chet swung an instrument upon it. He picked out a jet of violet light that could be distinguished, and he followed it with the crosshairs while he twirled a micrometer screw. Then he swiftly copied the reading that the instrument had inscribed. The invisible disk with its ghostly edges of violet was perceptibly larger as he slammed over the control ball to upend them in air. Under the control room's nitrogen illuminator, the cheeks of Herr Dr. Kreiss were pale and bloodless, as if his heart had ceased to function. Harkness had moved quietly back to the side of Diane Delacour and was holding her two hands firmly in his. The very air seemed charged with the quick tenseness of emotions. Schwartzmann must have sensed it even before he saw the onrushing death. Then he leaped to a lookout, and an instant later sprang at Chet calmly fingering the control. Fool, he screamed. You would kill us all. Turn away from it, away from it. He threw himself in a frenzy upon the pilot. The detonite pistol was still in his hand. Quick, he shouted, Turn us! Harkness moved swiftly, but the scientist, Kreiss, was nearer. It was he who smashed the gun hand down with a quick blow and snatched at the weapon. Schwartzmann was beside himself with rage. You too, he demanded. Give it to me, traitor. But the tall man stood uncompromisingly erect. Never, he said, have I seen a ship large enough to hold two commanding pilots. I take your orders in all things, Herr Schwartzmann, all but this. If we die, we die. Schwartzmann sputtered. We should have turned away. Even yet we might. It will, it will. Perhaps, agreed Kreiss, still in that precise classroom voice. Perhaps it will. But this I know. With an acceleration of 1,000 miles per hour, as this young man with the badge of a master pilot says, we cannot hope, in the time remaining, 
to overcome our present velocity. We can never check our speed and build up a relatively opposite motion before that globe would overwhelm us. If he has figured correctly, this young man, if he has found the true resultant of our two motions of approach, and if he has swung us that we may drive out on a line perpendicular to the resultant. I think I have, said Chet quietly. If I haven't, in just a few minutes it won't matter to any of us. It won't matter at all. He met the gaze of Herr Dr. Kreiss, who regarded him curiously. If we escape, the scientist told him, you will understand that I am under Herr Schwartzmann's command. I will be compelled to shoot you if he so orders. But, Herr Bullard, at this moment, I would be very proud to shake your hand. And Chet, as he extended his hand, managed a grin that was meant also for the tense, white-faced Harkness and Diane. I like to see him dealt that way, he said, right off the top of the deck. But the smile was erased as he turned back to the lookout. He had to lean close to see all of the disk, so swiftly was the approaching globe bearing down. It came now from the side. It swelled larger and larger before his eyes. Their own ship seemed unmoving. Only the unending thunder of the generator told of the fantastic efforts to escape. They seemed hung in space. Their own terrific speed seemed gone. Added to and fused with the orbital motion of the dark moon to bring swiftly closer that messenger of death. The circle expanded silently, became menacingly huge. Chet was whispering softly to himself, If I'd have got hold of her an hour sooner, thirty minutes or even ten, we're doing over twenty thousand an hour combined speed and we'll never really hit it, we'll never reach the ground. He turned this over in his mind, and he nodded gravely in confirmation of his own conclusion. It seemed somehow of tremendous importance that he get this clearly thought out, this experience that was close ahead. Skin friction, he added. It will burn us up. He had a sudden vision of a flaming star blazing a hot trail through the atmosphere of this globe. There would be only savage eyes to follow it, to see the line of fire curving swiftly across the heavens. He himself was seeing that blazing meteor so plainly. His eyes found the lookout. The globe was gone. They were close, close. Only for the enveloping gas that made of this dark moon, they would be seeing the surface, the outlines of continents. Chet strained his eyes to see nothing. It was horrible. It had been fearful enough to watch that expanding globe. He was abruptly aware that the outer rim of the lookout was red. For Chet Bullard, time ceased to have meaning. What were seconds or centuries as he stared at that glowing rim? He could not have told. The outer shell of their ship, it was radiant, shining red-hot in the night. And above the roar of the generator came a nerve-ripping shriek. A wind, like a blast from hell, was battering and tearing at their ship. Goodbye, he tried to call. The demoniac shrieking from without smothered his voice. One arm was across his eyes in an unconscious motion. The air of the little room was stifling. He forced his arm down. He would meet death face to face. The lookout was ringed with fire. It was white with a terrible white of burning steel. It was golden, then cherry red. It was dying, as the fire dies from glowing metal plunged into its tempering bath, or thrown into the cold reaches of space. In Chet's ear was the roar of a detonite motor. He tried to realize that the lookouts were rimmed with black, cold, fireless black, an incredible black. There were stars there like pinpoints of flame, but conviction came only when he saw from a lookout in another wall a circle of violet that shrank and dwindled as he watched. A hand was gripping his shoulder. 
He heard the voice of Walter Harkness speaking, while Walt's hand crept to raise the triple star that was pinned to his blouse. Master pilot of the world, Harkness was saying, that doesn't cover enough territory, old man. It's another rating that you're entitled to. But I'm damned if I know what it is. And for once, Chet's ready smile refused to form. He stared dumbly at his friend. His eyes passed to the white face of Mademoiselle Diane, then back to the controls where his hand, without conscious volition, was reaching to move a metal ball. Missed it, he assured himself, hit the fringe of the air, just the very outside. If we'd been twenty thousand feet nearer... He was moving the ball. Their bow was swinging. He steadied it and set the ship on an approximate course. A stern chase, he said aloud, all our momentum to be overcome. But it's easy sailing now. He pushed the ball forward to the limit, and the explosion motor gave a thunderous response. End of chapter 3《Four of Brood of the Dark Moon》by Charles Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Return to the Dark Moon. No man faces death in so shocking a form without feeling the effects. Death had flicked them with a finger of flame and had passed them by. Chet Bullard found his hands trembling uncontrollably as he fumbled for a book and opened it. The tables of figures printed there were blurred at first to his eyes, but he forced himself to forget the threat that was past, for there was another menace to consider now. And uppermost in his mind, when his thoughts came back into some approximate order, was condemnation of himself for an opportunity that was gone. I could have jumped him, he told himself, with bitter self-reproach. I could have grabbed the pistol from Kreiss. The man was petrified. And then Chet had to admit a fact that there was no use of denying. I was as paralyzed as he was, he said, and only knew he had spoken aloud when he saw the puzzled look that crossed Harkness's face. Harkness and Diane had drawn near. In a far corner of the little room, Schwartzmann had motioned to Kreiss to join him. They were as far away from the others as could be managed. Schwartzmann, Chet judged, needed some scientific explanation of these disturbing events. Also, he needed to take the detonite pistol from Kreiss's hand and jam it into his own hand. His eyes at Chet's unconscious exclamation had come with instant suspicion toward the two men. Forty-seven hours, Walt, the pilot said, and repeated it loudly for Schwartzmann's benefit. Forty-seven hours before we return to this spot. We are driving out into space. We've crossed the orbit of the Dark Moon, and we're doing twenty thousand miles an hour. Now we must decelerate. It will take twenty hours to check us to zero speed, then twenty-seven more to shoot us back to the same point in space, allowing, of course, for a second deceleration. The same figuring, with only slight variation, will cover a return to the dark moon. As we sweep out, I can allow for the moon motion, and will hit it at a safe landing speed on the return trip this time. Chet was paying little attention to his companion as he spoke. His eyes, instead, were covertly watching the bulky figure of Schwartzmann. As he finished, their captor shot a volley of questions at the scientist beside him. He was checking up on the pilot's remarks. Chet was leaning forward to stare intently from a lookout. His head was close to that of Harkness. Listen, Walt, he whispered. The moon's out of sight. It's easy to lose. Maybe I can't find it again. Anyway, it's going to take some nice navigating, but I'll miss it by ten thousand miles if you say so and even the Herr Doctor can't check me on it. Chet saw the eyes of Schwartzmann grow intent. 
He reached ostentatiously for another book of tables, and he seated himself that he might figure in comfort. "'Just check me on this,' he told Harkness. He put down meaningless figures, while the man beside him remained silent. Over and over he wrote them. Would Harkness never reach a decision? Over and over, until... "'I don't agree with that,' Harkness told him, and reached for the stylus in Chet's hand. And while he appeared to make his own swift computations, there were words instead of figures that flowed from his pen. Only alternative. Return to Earth, he wrote. Then S will hold off, wait in upper levels. Kreiss will give him new bearings. We'll shoot out again and do it better next time. Kreiss is nobody's fool. S means to maroon us on moon. Kill us, perhaps. He'll get us there, sure. We might as well go now. Chad had seen a movement across the room. Let's start all over again, he broke in abruptly. He covered the writing with a clean sheet of paper, where he set down more figures. He was well under way when Schwartzmann's quick strides brought him towering above them. Again the detonite pistol was in evidence. Its small black muzzle moved steadily from Harkness to Chet. For your life, such as is left of it, you may thank Herr Dr. Kreiss, he told Chet. I thought at first you would have attempted to kill us. His smile, as he regarded them, seemed to Chet to be entirely evil. You were near death twice, my dear Herr Bullard, and the danger is not entirely removed. Forty-seven hours, you have said. In forty-seven hours you will land us on the dark moon. If you do not, he raised the pistol suggestively. Remember that the pilot, Max, can always take us back to Earth. You are not indispensable. Chet looked at the dark face and its determined and ominous scowl. You're a cheerful sort of soul, aren't you? he demanded. Do you have any faint idea of what a job this is? Do you know we will shoot another two hundred thousand miles straight out before I can check this ship? Then we come back, and meanwhile the dark moon has gone on its way. Had you thought that there's a lot of room to get lost in out here? Forty-seven hours, says Schwartzman. I would advise that you do not lose your way. Chet shot one quizzical glance at Harkness. That, he said, makes it practically unanimous. Schwartzman, with an elaborate show of courtesy, escorted Diane Delacour to a cabin where she might rest. At a questioning look between Diane and Harkness, their captor reassured them. "'Mamselle shall be entirely safe,' he said. "'She may join you here whenever she wishes. As for you,' he was speaking to Harkness, "'I will permit you to stay here. I could tie you up, but this is not necessary.' And Harkness must have agreed that it was indeed unnecessary for either Kreiss or Max or some other of Schwartzmann's men, was at his side continuously from that moment on. Chet would have liked the chance for a quiet talk and an exchange of ideas. It seemed that somewhere, somehow, he should be able to find an answer to their problem. He stared moodily out into the blackness ahead, where a distant star was seemingly their goal. Harkness stood at his side, or paced back and forth in the little room, until he threw himself, at last, upon a cot. And always the great stern blast roared, muffled by the insulated walls. Its unceasing thunder came at last to be unheard. To the pilot there was neither sound nor motion. His directional sights were unswervingly upon that distant star ahead. Seemingly, they were suspended, helpless and inert, in a black void. But for the occasional glowing masses of strange living substance that flashed past in this ocean of space, he must almost have believed that they were motionless, a dead ship in a dead black night. But the luminous things flashed and were gone, and their coming, strangely, was from astern. They flicked past and vanished up ahead, and by this, Chet knew that their tremendous momentum was unchecked. Though he was using the great stern blast to slow the ship, 
it was driving the stern first into outer space. Nor, for twenty hours, was there a change, more than a slackening of the breathless speed with which the lights went past. Twenty hours, and then Chet knew that they were in all truth hung motionless. And he prayed that his figures that told him this was correct. More timeless minutes, an agony of waiting, a dimly glowing mass that was ahead, approached their bow, swung off, and vanished far astern. And with its going, Chet knew that the return trip was begun. He gave Harkness the celestial bearing marks and relinquished the helm. Full speed ahead as you are, he ordered. Then at 1940, on W.S. time, we'll cut it and ease on bow repulsion to the limit. And despite the strangeness of their surroundings, the ceaseless murmuring roar of the exhaust, the weird world outside, where endless space was waiting for man's exploration, despite the deadly menace that threatened, Chet dropped his head upon his outflung arms and slept. To a sleep-drugged brain, it was scarcely a moment until a hand was dragging at his shoulder. Forty-seven hours, the voice of Schwartzmann was saying, and some navigating, Harkness was exclaiming in flattering amazement, Wake up, Chet, wake up. The dark moon's in sight. You've hit it on the nose, old man. She isn't three points off the sights. The bow blast was roaring full on. Ahead of them, Chet's sleepy eyes found a circle of violet, and he rubbed his eyes savagely that he might take his bearings on sun and earth. As it had been before, the earth was a giant half-moon, like a mirror sphere it shot to them across the vast distance the reflected glory of the sun. But the globe ahead was a ghostly world, its black disk was lost in the utter blackness of space. It was a circle, marked only by the absence of star points, and by the halo, a violet glow, that edged it about. Chet cut down the repelling blast. He let the circle enlarge, then swung the ship end for end in mid-space, that the more powerful stern exhaust might be ready to counteract the gravitational pull of the new world. Again those impalpable clouds surrounded them. Here was the enveloping gas that made this a dark moon, the gas, if Harkness' theory was correct, that let the sun's rays pass unaltered that took the light through freely to illumine this globe, but that barred its return passage as reflected light. Black, dead black, was the void into which they were plunging, until the darkness gave way before a gentle glow that enfolded their ship. The golden light enveloped them in growing splendor. Through every lookout it was flooding the cabin with brilliant rays until from below them directly astern of the ship, where the thundering blasts checked their speed of descent, emerged a world. And to Chet Bullard, softly fingering the controls of the first ship of space, to Chet Bullard, whose uncanny skill had brought the tiny speck that was their ship safely back from the dark recesses of the unknown, there came a thrill that transcended any joy of the first exploration. Here was water, in great seas of unreal hue, and those seas were his, vast continents, ripe for adventure, and heavy with treasure, and they too were his, his own world, his and Diane's and Walt's. Who was this man, Schwartzmann, that dared dream of violating their possession? A slender tube, pressed firmly, uncompromisingly, into his back to give the answer to his question. Almost, I wish you had missed it, Herr Schwartzmann was saying, but now you will land. You will set us down in some place that you know. No tricks, Herr Bullard. You are clever, but not clever enough for that. We will land, yes, where you know it is safe. From the lookout, the man stared for a moment with greedy eyes, then brought his gaze back to the three. His men, besides Harkness and Diane, were alert. The scientist Kreiss stood close to Chet. 
A nice little world, Schwartzmann told them. Herr Harkness, you have filed claims on it. Who am I to dispute with the great Herr Harkness? Without question, it is yours. He laughed loudly while his eyes narrowed between creasing wrinkles of flesh. You shall enjoy it, he told them, all your life. And Chet, as he caught the gaze of Harkness and Diane, wondered how long this enjoyment would last. All your life. But this was rather indefinite as a measure of time. End of chapter 4《of Brood of the Dark Moon》by Charles Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A desperate act. The ship that Chet Bullard and Harkness had designed had none of the instruments for space navigation that the ensuing years were to bring. Chet's accuracy was more the result of that flyer's sixth sense, that same uncanny power that served aviators so well in an earlier day. But Chet was glad to see his instruments registering once more as he approached a new world. Even the sonoflector was recording. Its invisible rays were darting downward to be reflected back again from the surface below. That absolute altitude recording was a joy to read. It meant a definite relationship with the world. I'll hold her at fifty thousand, he told Harkness. Watch for some outline that you can remember from last time. There was an irregular area of continental size. Only when they had crossed it did Harkness point toward an outflung projection of land. That peninsula, he exclaimed, we saw that before. Swing south and inland. Now down forty. And east of south. This ought to be the spot. Perhaps Harkness, too, had the flyer's indefinable power of orientation. He guided Chet in the downward flight, and his pointing finger aimed at last at a cluster of shadows where a setting sun brought mountain ranges into strong relief. Chet held the ship steady, hung high in the air, while the quick spreading mantle of night swept across the world below. And at last, when the little world was deep buried in shadow, they saw the red glow of fires from a hidden valley in the south. "'Fire Valley,' said Chet. "'Don't say anything about me being a navigator. Walt, you've brought us home, sure enough.' Home? He could not overcome the strange excitement of a homecoming to their own world. Even the man who stood pistol in hand behind him was, for the moment, forgotten. Valley of a Thousand Fires, scene of his former adventures. Each fumarole was adding its smoky red to the fiery glow that illumined the place. There were ragged mountains hemming it in. Chet's gaze passed on to the valley's end. Down there, where the fires ceased, there would be water. He would land there. And the ship from Earth slipped down in a long slanting line to cushion against its under-exhausts, whose soft thunder echoed back from a bare expanse of frozen lava. Then its roaring faded. The silvery shape sank softly to its rocky bed as Chet cut the motor that had sung its song of power since the moment when Schwartzmann had carried him off, taken him from that frozen, forgotten corner of an incredibly distant Earth. "'Is there air?' Schwartzmann demanded. Chet came to himself again with a start. He saw the man peering from that lookout to the right and to the left, as if he would see all that there was in the last light of day. Strange, he was grumbling to himself. A strange place. But those hills, I saw their markings. There will be metals there. I will explore. Later I return. I will mine them. Many ships I must build to establish a line the first transportation line of space. Me, Jacob Schwartzman. I will do it. I will have more than anyone else on Earth. I will make them all come to me, crawling on their bellies. Chet saw the hard shine of the narrowed eyes. For an instant only, he dared to consider the chance of leaping upon the big, gloating figure. One blow and a quick snatch for the pistol. 
Then he knew the folly of such a plan. Schwartzmann's men were armed, and he would be downed in another second. His body a shattered, jellied mass. Schwartzmann's thoughts had come back to the matter of air. He motioned Chet and Harkness toward the port. Diane Delacour had joined them, and she thrust herself quickly between the two men. And though Schwartzmann made a movement as if he would snatch her back, he thought better of it and motioned for the portal to be swung. Chet felt him close behind as he followed the others out into the gathering dark. The air was heavy with the fragrance of night-blooming trees. They were close to the edge of the lava flow. The rock was black in the light of a starry sky. It dropped away abruptly to a lower glade. A stream made silvery sparklings in the night, while beyond it were waving shadows of strange trees whose trunks were ghostly white. It was all so familiar. Chet smiled understandingly as he saw Walt Harkness's arm go about the trim figure of Diane Delacour. No mannish attire could disguise Diane's charms, nor could nerve and cold courage that any man might envy detract from her femininity. Her dark curling hair was blowing back from her upraised face as the scented breezes played about her, and the soft beauty of that face was enhanced by the very starlight that revealed it. It was here that Walt and Diane had learned to love. What wonder that the fragrant night brought only remembrance and forgetfulness of their present plight. But Chet Bullard, while he saw them and smiled in sympathy, knew suddenly that other eyes were watching, too. He felt the bulky figure of Herr Schwartzmann beside him grow tense and rigid. But Schwartzmann's voice, when he spoke, was controlled. All right, he called toward the ship. All is safe. Yet Chet wondered at the sudden tensing, and an uneasy presentiment found entrance into his thoughts. He must keep an eye on Schwartzmann even more than he had supposed. Their captor had threatened to maroon them on the dark moon. Chet did not question his intent. Schwartzmann would have nothing to gain by killing them now. It would be better to leave them here, for he might find them useful later on. But did he plan to leave them all or only two? Behind the steady, expressionless eyes of the master pilot, strange thoughts were passing. There were orders at length to return to the ship. It is dark already, Schwartzmann concluded. Nothing can be accomplished at night. How long are the days and nights? he asked Harkness. Six hours, Harkness told him. Our little world spins fast. Then for six hours we sleep, was the order, and again Herr Schwartzmann conducted Mademoiselle Delacour to her cabin, while Chet Bullard watched until he saw the man depart and heard the click of the lock on the door of Diane's room. Then for six hours he listened to the sounds of sleeping men who were sprawled about him on the floor. For six hours he saw the one man who sat on guard beside a light that made any thought of attack absurd, and he cursed himself for a fool. As he lay wakeful and vainly planning, a poor, futile fool who was unable to cope with this man who had bested him. 1973, and here were Harkness and Diane and himself captured by a man who was mentally and morally a misfit in a modern world. A throwback, that was Schwartzmann. Harkness had said it. He belonged back in 1914. Harkness was beyond the watching guard. From where he lay came sounds of restless movement. Chet knew that he was not alone in this mood of hopeless dejection. There was no opportunity for talk. Only with the coming of day did the two find a chance to exchange a few quick words. The guards roused the others at the first sight of sunlight beyond the ports. Harkness sauntered slowly to where Chet was staring from a lookout. He, too, leaned to see the world outside, and he spoke cautiously in a half-whisper. Not a chance, Chet. No use trying to bluff this big crook any more. He's here, and he's safe, and he knows it as well as we do. 
We'll let him ditch us, you and Diane and me. Then, when we're on our own, we'll watch for our chance. He will go crazy with what he finds, may get careless, then we'll seize the ship. His words ended abruptly as Schwartzmann came behind them. He was casually calling Chet's attention to a fumarole from which a jet of vapor had appeared. Yellowish it was, and the wind was blowing it. Chet turned away. He hardly saw Schwartzmann or heard Harkness's words. He was thinking of what Walt had said. Yes, it was all they could do. There was no chance of a fight with them now. But later... Diane Delacour came into the control room at the instant. Her dark eyes were still lovely with sleep, but they brightened to flash an encouraging smile toward the two men. There were five of Schwartzmann's men in the ship beside the pilot and the scientist, Kreiss. They all crowded in after Diane. They must have had their orders in advance. Schwartzmann merely nodded, and they sprang upon Harkness and Chet. The two were caught off their guard. Their arms were twisted behind them before resistance could be thought of. Diane gave a cry, started forward, and was brushed back by a sweep of Schwartzmann's arm. The man himself stood staring at them, unmoving, wordless. Only the flesh about his eyes gathered into creases to squeeze the eyes to malignant slits. There was no mistaking the menace in that look. I think we do not need you any more, he said at last. I think, Herr Harkness, this is the end of our little argument. And, Herr Harkness, you lose. Now I will tell you how it is that you pay. You have thought, perhaps, I would kill you. But you were wrong, as you many times have been. You have not appreciated my kindness. You have not understood that mine is a heart of gold. Even I was not sure before we came what it is best to do. But now I know. I saw oceans and many lands on this world. I saw islands in those oceans. You so clever are. Such a great thinker is Herr Harkness. And on one of those islands you will have plenty of time to think, yes? You can think of your good friend Schwartzmann and of his kindness to you. You are going to maroon us on an island? asked Walt Harkness hoarsely. Plainly his plans for seizing the ship were going awry. You are going to put the three of us off in some lost corner of this world? Chet Bullard was silent until he saw the figure of Harkness struggling to throw off his two guards. Walt, he called loudly, take it easy, for God's sakes, Walt, keep your head. This, Chet sensed, was no time for resistance. Let Schwartzman go ahead with his plans. Let him think them complacent and unresisting. Let Max pilot the ship, then watch for an opening when they could land a blow that would count. He heard Schwartzman laughing now, laughing as if he were enjoying something more pleasing than the struggles of Walt. Chet was standing by the controls. The metal instrument table was beside him. Above it was the control itself, a metal ball that hung suspended in air within a cage of curved bars. It was pure magic, this ball control, where magnetic fields crossed and recrossed. It was as if the one who held it were a genie who could throw the ship itself where he willed. Glass almost enclosed the cage of bars, and the whole instrument swung with a self-compensating platform that adjusted itself to the gravitation of accelerated speed. The pilot, Max, had moved across to the instrument table, ready for the takeoff. Schwartzman's laughter died to a gurgling chuckle. He wiped his eyes before he replied to Harkness's question. Leave you, he said, in one place? Nine. One here, the other there. A thousand miles apart, it might be, and not all three of you. That would be so unkind. But he interrupted himself to call to Kreiss, who was opening the port. No, he ordered. Keep it closed. We are not going outside. We are going up. But Kreiss had the port open. I want a man to get some fresh water, he said. He will only be a minute. 
He shoved at a waiting man to hurry him through the doorway. It was only a gentle push. Chet wondered as he saw the man stagger and grasp at his throat. He was coughing, choking horribly, for an instant outside the open port, then fell to the ground, while his legs jerked awkwardly, spasmodically. Chet saw Kreiss follow. The scientist would have leaped to the side of the stricken man, whose body was so still now on the sunlit rock, but he too crumpled, then staggered back into the room. He pushed feebly at the port and swung it shut. His face, as he turned, was drawn into fearful lines. Acid, he choked out the words, between strangled breaths. Acid, sulfuric, fumes. Chet turned quickly to the spectro-analyzer. The lines of oxygen and nitrogen were merged with others, and that meant an atmosphere unfit for human lungs. There had been a fumarole where yellowish vapor was sprouting. He remembered it now. So, boomed Schwartzmann, and now his squinting eyes were full on Chet. You, you, Schwein, you said when we opened the ports there would be a surprise, and this is it? You thought to see us kill ourselves. Open that port, he shouted. The men who held Chet released him and sprang forward to obey. The pilot, Max, took their place. He put one hand on Chet's shoulder while his other hand brought up a threatening metal bar. Schwartzmann's heavy face had lost its stolid look. It was alive with rage. He thrust his head forward to glare at the men, while he stood firmly, his feet far apart, two heavy fists on his hips. He whirled abruptly and caught Diane by one arm. He pulled her roughly to him and encircled the girl's trim figure with one huge arm. Put you all on one island, he shouted. Did you think I would put you all out of the ship? You, he pointed at Harkness, and you, this time it was Chet, go out now. You can die in your damned gas that you expected would kill me. But, you fools, you imbeciles, Mademoiselle, she stays with me. The struggling girl was helpless in the great arm that drew her close. Harkness's mad rage gave place to a dead stillness. From bloodless lips in a chalk-white face, he spat out one sentence. Take your filthy hands off her now, or I'll... Schwartzmann's one free hand still held the pistol. He raised it with deadly deliberation. It came level with Harkness's unflinching eyes. Yes, said Schwartzmann. You will do what? Chet saw the deadly tableau. He knew with a conviction that gripped his heart, that here was the end. Walt would die, and he would be next. Diane would be left defenseless. The flashing thought that followed came to him as sharply as the crack of any pistol. It seemed to burst inside his brain, to lift him with some dynamic power of its own and project him into action. He threw himself sideways from under the pilot's hand, out from beneath the heavy metal bar, and he whirled as he leaped to face the man. One lean brown hand clenched to a fist that started a long swing from somewhere near his knees. It shot upward to crash beneath the pilot's outthrust jaw and lift him from the floor. Max had aimed the bar in a downward sweep where Chet's head had been the moment before. And now man and bar went down together. In the same instant, Chet threw himself upon the weapon and leaped backward to his feet. One frozen second, while to Chet, the figures seemed as motionless as if carved from stone. Two men beside the half-open port, Harkness in convulsive writhing between two others. The figure of Diane strained, tense, and helpless in Schwartzmann's grasp. And Schwartzmann, whose aim had been disturbed, steadying the pistol deliberately upon Harkness. Wait, Chet's voice tore through the confusion. He knew he must grip Schwartzmann's attention. Hold that trigger finger that was tensed to send a detonite bullet on its way. Wait, damn you. I'll answer your question. I'll tell you what we'll do. In that second, he swung the metal bar high. 
Now he brought it crashing down in front of him. Schwartzmann flinched, half turned as if to fire at Chet, and saw the blow was not for him. With a splintering crash, the bar went through an obstruction. There was a sound of glass that slivered to a million mangled bits, the sharp tang of metal broken off, a crash and clatter, then silence, save for one bit of glass that fell belatedly to the floor, its tiny jingling crash ringing loud in the deathly stillness of the room. It had been the control room, this place of metal walls and of shining, polished instruments, and it could be called that no longer. For battered to useless wreckage, there lay on a metal table a cage that had once been formed of curving bars. Among the fragments a metal ball that had guided the great ship still rocked idly from its fall until it, too, was still. It was a room where nothing moved, where no person so much as breathed. Then came the master pilot's voice, and it was speaking with quiet finality. And that, he said, is your answer. Our ship has made its last flight. His eyes held steadily upon the blanched face of Herr Schwartzmann, whose limp arms released the body of Diane. The pistol hung weakly at the man's side, and the pilot's voice went on, so quiet, so hushed, so curiously toneless, in that silent room. What was it that you said, that Harkness and I would be staying here? Well, you were right when you said that, Schwartzmann, but it's a hard sentence, that imprisonment for life. Chet paused now to smile deliberately, grimly, at the dark face, so bleached and bloodless, before he repeated, imprisoned for life, and you didn't know that you were sentencing yourself. For you were staying too, Schwartzmann, you contemptible thieving dog. You were staying with us, here, on the dark moon. End of chapter 5